very important for y'all to start understanding. As you learn about mechanical ventilation, you're going to see a lot of patients that initially are treated with non-invasive ventilation. I think you have to have an understanding of where it fits in. It's not just something you throw at people. It's something that has clear indications, and the literature is very clear about when it works and when it doesn't work, whereas you'll probably see for yourself, as I experienced as I watched it clinically evolve, that people tended to use it as a stepping stone. In other words, everybody got non-invasive ventilation before they got intubated. It doesn't work well that way. And if you understand where it does work, you'll be very successful, whereas if you just throw it at people, you're going to find that you may actually do harm. So I chose uh, Know When to Hold Up, Know When to Fold Up, which, as you know, is a, a Kenny Rogers song. But he didn't write it, but it is still a very good song. I'm sure you've seen the commercial for Geico that's on now. But uh, you need to know when to continue to use it, hold up, and when it's not useful, and you need to hold up and go to mechanical ventilation. But let's uh, talk about non-invasive ventilation. And you can use different abbreviations, but non-invasive ventilation is a a general term that most people use. Uh, the two abbreviations would be non-invasive um, positive pressure ventilation, which is the one I put up here, or a lot of the slides will say NIV, non-invasive ventilation, which is a little shorter. And it's when ventilatory support is delivered without establishing an endotracheal airway, without intubating the patient. And you'll see today that a lot of the discussion will be about when to use this versus intubation and full ventilatory support. History is a little bit interesting you know that we all ventilate with negative pressure ventilation. That's how we normally ventilate. So when I inhale, I create normal uh, negative pressure in my pleural space, and air goes in, and we create positive pressure when we exhale. So positive pressure ventilation is non-physiologic to start with. So as soon as we start blowing air in, it's not physiologic. We create VQ mismatch. Let me demonstrate that very simply. If I take any one of you in this room, your PCO2 at rest is 40, correct? Right around 40. Unless I've stressed you out and asked you a question, it might go down a little bit when you hyperventilate. And your pH is right 740. It's not 743. It's pretty close. So remember, it's a log scale. We call the normal range 735 to 745, but if somebody has a 735 pH, that's abnormal. And you need to ask yourself why that is. Likewise, the CO2, unless you're heavy set or have lung disease or, or hyperventilating, it should be right at 40. Now, your minute ventilation is your tidal volume times your respiratory rate. So when you're at rest, depending on how big you are, your minute ventilation is what? Four liters, three to five, depending on how big you are. Is If I took any one of you right now and put you on positive pressure ventilation, to get your CO2 to 40, I would have to increase your minute ventilation because it's not as efficient. We create VQ mismatch with positive pressure ventilation. So it's not physiologic. Whereas an iron lung is indeed negative pressure ventilation. So the iron lung during the polio epidemic was more physiologic. And there are apparatuses we use, or you could actually still use an iron lung. And that is more physiologic. And maybe eventually we'll get to ventilating people in the hospital more with negative pressure, which again, is more physiologic. We create problems when we put in endotracheal tubes, as I'll demonstrate today. What, what made non-invasive ventilation uh, explode was uh, sleep apnea, because people started uh, treating sleep apnea, we started having better masks, better machines, and we were able to now ventilate people without putting a tube down their throat. So th that's really when it kind of took off. So this is a patient that is being ventilated with non-invasive ventilation. And you can use just a nasal mask, or generally we use a mask that goes up the nose and mouth at the same time, which is called a, a face mask. Um, but you can do it this way. And I want to point out a couple things about this patient. One is, he's awake. He's alert. He's not fighting. And he's sitting up. He's not obtunded, laying in bed with his mask strapped to his face. So... As soon as the patient isn't really able to cooperate with non-invasive ventilation, you already have a problem. So when you try to use it in people that are, are uh, either not conscious or are unstable, it's not going to work. Now, how many of you all have already seen people try to use it in that setting? Yes, I suspect so. And that's exactly what I saw when I first decided to put this talk together. And uh, I updated the talk a little bit for you all. Um, 
But you have to understand pressure support to understand non-invasive ventilation, because all of it is basically pressure support. You know, the newer modes of ventilation that we're all throwing around on these fancy ventilators really aren't dramatically different than what we used to do. Uh, when pressure support was added to ventilators, it was a big change, and now we kind of use pressure support with other modes. But if you understand just right, straight pressure support, which you need to understand to understand non-invasive ventilation. So what happens with pressure support is initially the patient creates negative pressure, like I mentioned, and then the machine senses that and starts giving flow. So the machine is responding to the patient initiating a breath. And yes, you can put it so that it's timed and the patient gets breaths whether he's not breathing. But honestly, if the patient ain't initiating the breaths, they probably shouldn't be on non-invasive ventilation to start with. So the flow rapidly goes up until it achieves the pressure that you have set. You're telling the machine, I want the peak pressure to be this number. I'm sorry. This number. And then the flow will adjust as the lungs fill. The flow will decrease to maintain the pressure at the same level you've told it to do. So the flow decreases, flow changes. And when the flow decreases to a certain preset level, sometimes it's a quarter of the peak flow, or sometimes it's time, the breath turns off, and then the pressure goes back down. What does that do? It augments the patient's tidal volume. So instead of him taking a breath and getting 300 cc's, now he initiates a breath, the machine blows him up by giving flow and maintains a pressure for a certain period of time or until the flow drops to a certain level, and then he's allowed to exhale. When pressure support first came out and was put on ventilators, they didn't realize they had to have a backup for the turning it off. So if the flow fell to a quarter of the peak flow, it turned off. That's how it was set. But if you had an air leak, what if you had an air leak? The flow never drops because it's you got an air leak in the flow. The machine's saying, I need to keep the pressure here. And they realized that some patients had trouble. They were not allowed to exhale, and they even had a couple of deaths initially. So there's a backup on the machine that says, if it goes over a certain period, two to three seconds, uh, it'll stop, even if the flow doesn't decrease. So the machine's going to do what you tell the machine to do. And that's what you have to remember. Okay, so what are the determinants of the tidal volume the patient gets? So we're not setting the volume. In pressure ventilation, you don't set the volume. It's the level of pressure support, so the higher number you set in the machine, the more volume they're going to get. It depends on the patient effort. If the patient makes a shallow effort, the pressure quickly goes up, and the breath will turn off soon. You won't get the volume. So it does depend on how much the patient's cooperating. Uh, it depends on the compliance. So if the system is stiff, and that doesn't include just the lungs, it includes the chest wall and the abdomen, then you'll get a smaller tidal volume. So you're starting to get the idea already that if the lungs are very stiff, let's say ARDS, this might not work so well. And finally, the resistance, so that if there's a lot of bronchospasm, it could be a problem, or if there's just an airway problem, especially the upper airway. So when we take an endotracheal tube, we're bypassing the, the laryngeal structures. And if there's really a problem there, you, you, it's not affecting the way you ventilate them with the mechanical ventilator. When you start talking about non-invasive ventilation, uh, the upper airway is very important. And again, level of consciousness, patient participating, all of that's important. Okay, so let's look at a little some terminology. Uh, continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP, is what we initially usually do uh, on patients uh, for sleep apnea or uh, just in patients maybe who are weaning, we'll do a CPAP trial. And uh, it's uh, very similar to, to the PEEP. The only difference is when we're using positive pressure, uh, we're giving positive pressure and leaving, if you will, CPAP at the bottom, and that's the PEEP. So when we're doing invasive ventilation, we talk about pressure support. So that's where we tell the machine when the patient inhales to give a certain pressure, and the volume will be determined by the things I showed you on the last slide. And then it leaves some positive end expiratory pressure, which is, again, similar to the CPAP. 
Now, some people would call CPAP non-invasive ventilation, and some people would. I don't want to get caught up on that. In my opinion, it is flow, so I would consider CPAP a form of non-invasive ventilation. But generally, when we talk about non-invasive ventilation, we're talking about a combination, basically, of pressure support and CPAP, or pressure support peak. But when we use it, we call it inspiratory positive pressure, the IPAP, and the expiratory positive pressure, the EPAP. The EPAP is the same thing as CPAP or BPAP. Um, Bi-level and BiPAP are synonymous terms. So a little terminology. And don't worry, we're going to get this uh, a lot of clinical literature in just a minute. So I've tried to emphasize already patient selection is important. If, if, if somebody needs full support, they probably shouldn't be on non-invasive ventilation. So only partial ventilatory support is required. Duration of support less than 36 hours. When I first made this slide, I had uh, um, 48. Um, and actually, I meant to put 72 hours in. That's a mistake. So three days. Three days. Uh, alert and cooperative patient. Um, ideally, not everybody is, but ideally, upper airway function intact. We sort of mentioned that. Some people just can't tolerate the mask, especially beards or their face didn't shape right or they had trauma. So you've got to keep in mind, if this mask isn't going to fit well, it's not going to work. And then the patient tolerance. Some patients just will not let you strap the positive pressure mask to your face. Has anybody in here tried CPAP or BiPAP just to see what it feels like? I actually did that right before this talk, and uh, I did it last time before the talk, and it's interesting. Um, and when you start looking at some of the numbers for the level of pressures we use in non-invasive ventilation, you start realizing you can't go too high because somebody just won't tolerate it. So if you're needing pressures more than 20 for to ventilate somebody, they should be on a regular ventilator because they're not going to tolerate it. Okay, so there's been some proven scenarios where non-invasive ventilation is beneficial. And the most common is exacerbations of COPD. There's lots of data out now that it works. It was the first thing that we found that it was, that we proved it was beneficial for. But also hypercapnic respiratory failure of other etiologies. So let's say an obesity hypoventilation patient who's got some pneumonia. And it wouldn't be bad enough pneumonia in somebody like yourselves to even need a ventilator. But this person doesn't have the reserve. So other reasons for hypercapnic respiratory failure could be included with COPD. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema has been well studied. I, I would encourage you all to use the term when you look at x-rays to say hydrostatic pulmonary edema, not, not say congestive heart failure. So when you read an when an X-ray report comes back and it says congestive heart failure, that's really not not accurate. That's implying that the problem is from the left ventricle, the valves. But if you're in renal failure or liver failure and you just hold on a lot of fluid, you can be in hydrostatic edema and your heart's working fine. So it's very confusing sometimes when you look at the echo report and the radiologist is telling you, oh, that's heart failure or this pulmonary edema, and you're saying, well, the echo is fine, it can't be. That's not true. Remember, you have, the echo is just one tool you're using to make a decision about your patient. The x-ray is another tool. You've got to look at the whole picture before you uh, say, well, it can't be fluid because the echo looks good. You know, when you look at ejection fractions, don't forget to look at the rest of the echo report, too, because valvular heart disease, you've got to look for uh, more subtle findings on that echo report to hint that that's really the problem. And, and, I, and I know y'all tend to just look at that uh, ejection fraction and say the echo's fine and move on. If you get to rotate with me, I will uh, emphasize that. Facilitate weeding. Um, so that can be either somebody you want to take off a ventilator or somebody in the after surgery, so post-operative. They like to use it if they've maybe extubated the patient a little too soon. And it can be very effective there. Selective cases of hypoxic respiratory failure. And that's where we run into trouble. And I'm going to show you data today in that regard. So, yes, in hydrostatic edema, COPD exacerbations, it's pretty clear we can get some benefit. When you start using it outside of those two categories, you've got to be, you have to be very careful. And uh, hopefully you'll have a better feel for that after this lecture. Finally, and I'll show you the study that first came out that showed that pneumonia and immunosuppressed patients, it may be beneficial, it is beneficial, some of the subsequent data is mixed, but a lot of people would include this as a third category that's proven 
I think that's arguable. I think the first two categories, hypercapnic respiratory failure and hydrostatic pulmonary edema, it, it is definitely to uh, be a benefit to avoid putting somebody on mechanical demolition. What are the contraindications? Well, we sort of mentioned it, the need for full ventilatory support. Hemodynamic instability. Every study you read where they have failures, the patients that are hypotensive or otherwise hemodynamically unstable, arrhythmias, they do very poorly. And if the patient's unstable, you need to intubate them, you need to control the situation, you're just messing around when you try to use non-invasive ventilation, and you're potentially doing harm. Impaired mental status likewise. Uh, you know, you can be a little bit altered, but if you're significantly uh, altered, uh, you've got to be very careful for a couple reasons. One, you might have an unstable respiratory drive. Uh, two, the patient can't really tell you they're not, it's not working. And finally, they're just not going to be as good with their secretions. Along those lines, risk of aspiration and secretions. So when I see elderly patients come in with pneumonia and they have some phlegm and somebody's trying to treat them with non-invasive ventilation, you can almost guarantee that it's going to be a problem because these people are weak. What makes us cough? Our intercostals, our ability to take a deep breath with our diaphragm, get the air in there and then force it out. Well, one of the reasons we see so much pneumonia in elderly people is because their ability to cough and clear the secretions is diminished as they get weaker. And it's very dramatic, especially as we're seeing more and more octogenarians and even people in their 90s. Uh, acidosis, likewise. Uh, refractory hypoxemia and acidosis. So if, if your gas exchange deficit, uh, abnormality is too severe, it's just not going to work. Or if you have a significant metabolic acidosis such that your minute ventilation is very high to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. So you're just getting the feel right now that if you're too sick, you shouldn't be using this stuff. And then finally, intolerance or it's not working. So intolerance is the patient just doesn't handle it. And that's usually fairly obvious up front. And you got to be careful. You can't just sedate them out of it because then you're going to decrease their respiratory drive. So you got to be very careful saying, I'm going to get by by sedating them. And finally, it's just not working. So anytime you try it, you need to assess over the next hour or two if you're not, if it's not working, you need to probably just go ahead and intubate the patient. So, uh, messing around with it too long ends up creating more problems. Okay, so let's look at some data. This was the first study in 1995 that came out that showed us that we could use it. Non-invasive ventilation in acute exacerbations of COPD. It was a prospective randomized trial in selected patients with respiratory failure. So they did have a significant respiratory acidosis, but not an extreme respiratory acidosis. So, you know, pH is below 720, you probably shouldn't be using non-invasive ventilation at all. In this group, this is uh, the range they use. Patients that were lower, they intubated. But that only accounts for about 31% of COPD admissions. So most people coming with COPD either aren't going to need anything or have to be intubated directly. The primary outcome variable was the need for intubation. So it's a fairly clean study. What they found was that 31 of the 42 in the standard treatment group required intubation. So they weren't offered non-invasive ventilation. They were put on standard inhaled therapy, steroids, oxygen, or just intubated, and they had to be intubated right away. But 11 of the 43 patients that were put in the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation group required intubation. So you can see that they intubated less people when they used non-invasive ventilation up front. The hospital stay was significantly longer in the standard treatment group, and the mortality was lower in the non-invasive group. So if you didn't have to intubate the patient, it was very helpful in their mortality. And this was When this came out, people said, oh, we got to start using this for everything. And that's where we got into a little trouble. This shows you some of the data here. You can see that, uh, you know, the patients that were in the standard group, a lot of them got intubated within three hours. And a few of the people that they tried non-invasive ventilation on had to be intubated within the first 12 hours. They just, it didn't work. There was a, only two late intubations on people that got by after the first 12 hours of non-invasive ventilation. But the people on standard therapy, there was a number of them that, that uh, pooped out later, if you will. And you can imagine that it cl clearly increases your length of stay, which you see here. Uh, and again, we already commented on the mortality. So the study showed that it improved both mortality and length of stay. Okay, so... Again, there's a number of studies about hydrostatic edema or heart failure, but I wanted to show this one for a couple reasons. This was a randomized prospective trial of bilevel or BiPAP versus CPAP in acute pulmonary edema. And one reason I want to show you this study is you may be taught 
that in, in heart failure or, or acute pulmonary edema, that CPAP and BiPAP are just as good as one another. And the literature does sort of suggest that. As a pulmonologist and somebody that uh, sees the physiologic difference between the two, I would tell you you probably should go with BiPAP. One reason BiPAP, there's, that argument is still, uh, there's still some controversy there is because, as I'll show you, some of the early studies suggested that BiPAP, even though it was just as beneficial, resulted in a higher rate of myocardial infarctions in people with acute pulmonary edema. That hasn't panned out, but I'm gonna, this is one of the studies that, that was the case. So there was a higher rate of myocardial infarctions in the bi-level group in this study and some other studies. But at this point in time, I will tell you, even though CPAP and BiPAP haven't been shown to be a lot different in this setting, the heart attack issue probably is not real. So this is, you know, this is how y'all treat people that come in with pulmonary edema. Lasix, morphine, nitroglycerin. Look how long these people were on it, only seven and six hours. Because you're getting them out of pulmonary edema. You're giving something that will fix the problem. And um, they were nice to you for a couple days. Uh, and again, it emphasizes that this treatment is beneficial to people that you think will not need ventilatory support very long. They're going to need more than three days, and you think that up front. And what is the natural course of ARDS? Is it less than seven days? Seven to ten days? More than ten days? Seven to ten days. Now, there's people that are longer. There's a few people that we get better a little quicker. And as I'll show you, it just doesn't work very well in ARDS. And part of the reason is this type of treatment doesn't work well if you think the patient's going to need therapy for more than about three days. So you should ask yourself that question right up front. And this just shows you... Uh, what happens when you put somebody on non-invasive ventilation? Well, you'd expect this. Here's their respiratory rate over 30. And when you help them, it comes down. But notice that this is the BiPAP versus the CPAP. It comes down more with BiPAP. If you're going to remember one number for weaning people, if their respiratory rate is over 30 on anything, whether it's a CPAP trial, a T-bar, uh, even still on the ventilator, they're not ready to come off. 30 is a good number to remember for weaning. There is no magic weaning for them. Um, this shows you what happens to the uh, carbon dioxide in the blood uh, when you start ventilating people. And it, again, you can see again the bi level is better than the CPAP. And this is just read this as oxygenation. I'll show you that uh, ratio a little later. But uh, oxygenation improves. So gas exchange improves more with bi level or BiPAP than CPAP. So you would have to agree that it makes sense to use BiPAP instead of CPAP. It just looks better. But uh, again, in the uh, cardiology literature, you might see that, or you might be taught it doesn't matter. I would tell you just use BiPAP and don't, don't fight about it. This is the, uh, uh, the morbidity and mortality. And, you know, the mortality was similar. Um, I mean, they only had a couple deaths. But this is the number that scared people about BiPAP. And why should that happen? People were asking themselves, why should the more physiologic type of positive pressure, is it because the peak pressure is higher generally than when you use just CPAP alone? And again, that didn't pan out, but I wanted you to be aware that that's something that you might hear. So uh, let's move on and talk about non-invasive mechanical ventilation and weaning of patients with respiratory failure due to COPD. So not only is it beneficial to try to prevent people with COPD exacerbation from ending up on a ventilator, you can help wean them. This is a very interesting study. Uh, they looked at patients who failed spontaneous breathing trials at 48 hours after being intubated. And even though they failed the spontaneous breathing trial, they extubated half of them and put them on non-invasive ventilation. The rest, they continue to wean with a pressure support wean. I mean, that's pretty aggressive. You're not ready to come off the ventilator, but I'm going to take you off anyway and put you on a mask. The, the non-invasive patients had decreased mortality and a shorter ICU stay. And that, that was, would have been surprising if you told me that's going to happen when it, at that point in my career. Um, now, this is the patient characteristics. And this is 56 required immediate intubation. This is when they first came in. This is before they used any non-invasive. The rest who were intubated had failed an initial attempt at non-invasive ventilation. So uh, these patients were on HOMO2 with an average FEV1 of 500 cc's. Is that low? That's very low. So 
Y'all's FEV1, depending on your size again, is three to five liters. That's the four, six, fire query volume one, how much you blow out in per second when you can be a feed. Total you blow out, of course, vital capacity. The amount you blow out in the first second is a force expiratory volume in one second. These are 500 cc's, 0.5 liters. I don't have many patients over the years that I've seen that have this low. You have to be small to be alive with this. So that's very low. These people had bad COPD, and it was done in Italy. And I really did not understand how they could have to find so many people with these low FEV ones to do the study on. And I uh, recently got married, and actually my wife is sitting in the back to watch me to make sure I do a good job for y'all. Um, we, we went to Italy for our honeymoon, and uh, they're just smaller people. There's a lot of people who have smoke. There's not a lot of heavy people. There's a lot of little old smoking men running around. But they had seven nosocomial pneumonias in the continued intubation group. So when they failed the spontaneous breathing trial, the patients that stayed on the ventilator and went to fresh support weaning, they had more pneumonias. Four of whom died. But none of the patients that they took off, even though they failed the spontaneous breathing trial and then weaned them with non-invasive ventilation, none of them uh, died. And they didn't have any pneumonia. So that's one of the take-home points. It's very clear that if you can avoid intubating somebody, which gets rid of the defenses of the upper airway and gives a conduit for bugs, presumably, to get down there, amongst other reasons that might uh, create uh, nosocomal pneumonia or, or lead to nosocomal pneumonia. But if you can avoid intubating people, you can decrease the risk of nosocomal pneumonia. However, you can't use that as an argument to use non-invasive ventilation when you should be using full ventilation. It's very important you understand that. People are going to say, oh, no, don't, put, don't intubate them because that increases the risk of nosocomial pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia. But if you don't have a disease that's been documented to benefit from non-invasive ventilation, you increase the morbidity and mortality even more. That's really the take-home message. Do not be talked into saying, we always got to start with non-invasive ventilation because it decreases the risk of the mother. You're, you're being sold bad debt. And your patients are not are going to do worse. Now I'm going to prove it to you by showing you literature. But before I do that, this is a non-invasive ventilation in immunosuppressed patients with infiltrates fever and respiratory failure. And uh, this was a very well done study. They actually had two arms, 26 patients in each group. They looked at Non-invasive ventilation versus standard therapy, which meant these people weren't ready to be intubated. So they just said, we're going to put them on non-invasive ventilation or just start treating them. And most had hematologic cancer and neutropenia. So presumably, the neutropenia could resolve over a day or two or a couple days, especially if they were getting Neupogen or something like that. And 20 of the 26 standard treatments did, did end up requiring intubation versus only 12 of the 26 in the non-invasive group. And the mortality was markedly different. Those that needed to be intubated uh, had, in the first arm had a 69% mortality versus 38% in the other group. And that was all due to the fact that they didn't have, they got by without intubating people. So very clearly it was beneficial there. Uh, one more study in regards to um, using non-invasive ventilation to avert extubation failures patients at risk. The take-home message here is, in the hypercabinic respiratory failure, which is generally all COPD, it works very nicely. So you take somebody off the ventilator, it looks like they're not going to do well. You can definitely avoid reintubating people in the COPD group or maybe some other people with hypercabinic respiratory failure. But in the hypoxic respiratory failure patients, it did not add anything. And as I'll show you, probably increases morbidity and mortality. Okay, now this is this is not a non-invasive ventilation study. It's something I want to emphasize to you. Uh, the independent effects um, of the etiology of failure and the time to reintubation on outcome in patients, failing extubation. So again, these are patients that failed extubation. They're on a ventilator for whatever reason. And patients who fail extubation have to be reintubated have up to a 40% mortality. And it's an independent marker of disease severity. The complications of reintubation certainly are a factor. 
nosocomial mm -hmm. pneumonia is certainly a factor, which is a complication. And um, the other problem is they may deteriorate during the period of time that you try to hold off the intubation. So the question there is, if I could get them over this with non-invasive ventilation, am I helping them? Now, again, we're going to look at that um, in patients that aren't just the COPD group. Clearly, in the COPD group, you can benefit. But how about other people who are your extubating? And this just, again, emphasizes to you that the complication that you're worried about is the pneumonia. There are some others, but pneumonia is really the one that when you have to reintubate people, you're concerned that now you've increased their risk of pneumonia. That's ventilator-associated pneumonia, which is a subset of nosocomial. Okay. Now, look at this. This is very interesting. Again, this is a study. This isn't in patients on non-invasive ventilation. This was just to give you a background. The time to reintubate. So somebody comes off the ventilator and they're not doing well. Well, if you reintubate them within the first 12 hours, they only have 24% mortality. If you're dawdling, if you will, or putting it off, and trying to see if you can get by without it, look what happens when you wait longer to the mortality. So the point is, you have to be very careful when somebody fails extubation to say, you know what, I just need to bite the bullet and put it right back on. Now, the question again is, not, not just in COPD, but in all comers, can I avert this with non-invasive ventilation? This is a study that looked at that and which showed dramatic results of why you have to be very careful in your patient selection of non-invasive ventilation in that setting, post-extubation, as well as in general. And this looked at 221 patients in eight countries. This was done all, all through Europe. They were randomly assigned after appropriate weaning to get non-invasive ventilation or standard therapy. So these people felt to be at risk when they're extubated. And the failures could be crossed over and put on non-invasive ventilation if they were the standard group. And the patients were re-intubated for very specific criteria in both groups, whether you, even in the crossover group. So they were very clear when you had to be re-intubated. But what they found was the patients that went straight to non-invasive ventilation, 55 of 114 required reintubation, and they had 21 deaths. The patients that just got standard therapy, they had about the same amount that had to get reintubated, but they only had 11 deaths. And they had one death in the 28 patients that from the uh, standard therapy group that crossed over. But the difference in the death rate here was so dramatic the study was stopped due to the increased mortality. And interestingly, the time to reintubate was longer in the group that they tried to keep from reintubating with non invasive ventilation. So, again, and I'm using the term dawdling or dragging your feet, if somebody needs to be back on the ventilator, or again, even up front, acting like non invasive ventilation is, is helping the patient when it's not clearly indicated is a mistake. That's what I want to teach you. And I think if you see somebody doing it who's at upper level or at any, you shouldn't hesitate to say, I, maybe we should intubate this patient. Because you will help the patient decrease mortality and morbidity, decrease lucas state. Okay, so again, what are the benefits and risk of non-invasive ventilation? This looked at 299 patients with de novo respiratory failure. This is hypoxic respiratory failure. So they use different terms. Versus 225 patients with what we consider the proven indications for non-invasive ventilation. Hydrostatic pulmonary edema or heart failure and hypocapnic respiratory failure, which is almost always due to COPD in these studies. And the non-invasive ventilation failure followed by intubation had an increased mortality. So if you tried to use it and it didn't work, you increased mortality. And they theorize that inadequate or prolonged use of non-invasive ventilation delays an in intubation. And there's an increase, they, they found an increase in nosocomial pneumonia in the people they delayed, but it wasn't statistically significant. So there are other factors besides just nosocomial pneumonia. When you put off intubating a patient, you need to be They just get sicker, they're not perfusing. So that it's not just the pneumonia. Okay, just a little reminder about ARDS and the definition. And with the definition we've used in this country since 1994, Acute onset with predisposing conditions, uh, bilateral infiltrates on an X-ray. We've dropped the, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, 
pretty much most of us have already dropped because we're not doing swans as much in this country. But what I want to show you is when they talk about the PAO, PAO2, the arterial oxygen content, to the FiO2 ratio of less than 200. And because it came up in these slides, I just wanted to point out to you how you do that number. So let's say the PaO2 is a 60 in the arterial blood gas on 60%. You then express the percent of two as a fraction. So it's 60 divided by 0.6 to get that number. So again, we were saying less than 200. Now, have y'all heard of the Berlin definition for ARDS? Is that a term familiar to y'all? You, yeah, you, you, you're going to start seeing that. In this country, we quite haven't adopted it yet. Basically, it throws out the wedge. It gets rid of the term acute lung injury, and now it just has mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is 300 to 200. Uh, moderate is 200 to 100, which is what we used to call the first one acute lung injury. 200 and below was ARDS. Now we're calling it mild instead of lung injury, moderate and severe ARDS, less than 100 severe. So those, the terminology is changing a little bit. But I wanted you all to be familiar with how to calculate that ratio so when people are talking about it, you understand where those numbers come from. And that's whether you're on a ventilator or not. Okay, so let's talk about using non-invasive non -invasive ventilation in acute lung injury. And these patients clearly met the criteria in this country for what we call ARDS. They have the ratio of less than 200. So in Europe, they use the term maybe a little more. This means ARDS in this article for sure. They're not talking about uh, the other group uh, that's uh, less than 300. But uh, they had 54 patients with various diseases, pneumonia, vasculitis, sepsis, and exacerbations of interstitial lung disease, which I comment on because Dr. Roman and Dr. Perez uh, that's their specialty. And you might see a little more of that here um, in patients because those patients are followed uh, locally. Uh, 38 failed non-invasive ventilation with double the expected mortality. So when they try to use non-invasive ventilation instead of going right to intubation, because this isn't a clear indication for non-invasive ventilation, they had a higher mortality than was expected. Uh, these patients tended to have a higher minute ventilation in tidal volumes Initially, even before intubation, they had a higher severity of illness score. They were more hypoxic. With, uh, and again, this would fit into the category of modern ARDS with the new uh, terminology. And they also tended to have a metabolic acidosis. So we're really just going right back to what I emphasized from the beginning. The sicker you are, the less likely this is going to work. And if you have a disease that is not proven to be beneficial in, you have to be very careful who you're going to try to skate by with it. And I use that term to skate by because if you make a mistake and you don't skate by and you have to intubate the patient, you have now increased their morbidity of infection. Okay, so um, this is sort of a recent summary that I thought was uh, described nicely. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is another abbreviation there, may be overused in non-COPD patients. There's been a threefold increase in the use in COPD, but also in other patients. So again, what we've all seen is instead of using it where it's clearly been shown to be beneficial, we're using it on lots of other people. Um, the neurologic disease, asthma, pneumonia, sepsis, and the rate of failure for COPD um, versus the other is it's the failure rate is 12% in COPD or hypocatenic respiratory failure at 18% in these other cases. The mortality in failures was only slightly higher. But remember, if you have a, more failures, that translates into a much higher mortality. Conclusion. Think twice before using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation patients without COPD or hydrostatic removal. That is the take on this. Understand that the literature supports where it's used, and it actually clearly does not support its misuse in certain disease processes. Um, and this is just, I put this reference on here because if anybody wants to go read, this is a wonderful review, very good discussion. So this is a meta-analysis of 78 studies where 57 studies had acute respiratory failure. But they're comparing it to, pay, to standard therapy, not to mechanical ventilation. So some of this, it's very hard to discern 
uh, what I've been trying to teach y'all from the literature because if you're comparing partial ventilation to standard therapy, no ventilation, of course they're going to do some of that. If you're comparing it to mechanical ventilation, it's hard to do also because some patients have to go right to mechanical ventilation. So, but again, only four of these, the alternative out of 57 studies was mechanical ventilation. Fourteen were to prevent respiratory failure. So they don't, they don't need anything when they come in. But you're saying, oh, I think they're going to get worse. Let's see if I can keep them from using the And seven were to facilitate extubation. And I showed you literature, data on, the literature on all of those categories. And the survive, but again, the take-home message, survival benefit, benefit could be lost with non-invasive ventilation is applied late. Or in the wrong cases, such as ARDS. There's an 80, up to an 80% failure rate in ARDS. So you got to know when to hold up and when to fold up. Okay, so I'm going to make a few comments, but that's most of it. Um, and again, you're welcome to ask me questions, then, so think of them if you have any. Uh, wait a minute here, Mr. Crumley. Maybe it isn't kidney stones after all. What I see y'all being taught as younger doctors is that the x-ray test or the echo, that's, that's the diagnosis. The tests are a tool for you to make the diagnosis. They are not the diagnosis. And maybe later we can, I have a presentation where the radiographic studies or other studies miss the diagnosis. And you had to be able to think through that and make the diagnosis clinically. So make a good diagnosis and the the data you're getting has to help you make a diagnosis, but it, it's not what makes a diagnosis. You have to make the diagnosis, and then the appropriate treatments are based on what you have diagnosed. So I, I sort of simplify uh, an approach to critical care. You can really do this for all patients, but identify the problem. One reason that the pulmonologists have become more the critical care doctors than maybe what it started out as the anesthesiologist the anesthesiologists are used to treating the problem, treating the numbers. They're not asking themselves, how did the patient get in this mess? That's what you want to know. You want to figure out why is that patient in your ER, in your ICU, in your hospital. If you figure out what's wrong with them, you're going to have a much better chance of making them right. If you're just treating the blood pressure or the numbers, the sodium, and you don't figure out why it's a problem, you're not going to do as well. So identify the problem. And it sounds like, oh, well, what is he telling us? Of course we do that. It's surprising how often I might get called to see a consult and nobody's really said, why is this patient here? What started this? Fix the problem. Treat. So you got if you if you don't identify the problem correctly, you're not going to fix it. How many times have you seen patients, the ER doctor calls you up and says, oh, there's pneumonia. They get admitted, you treat them for pneumonia, and three days later you realize it's not pneumonia and they're not getting better. Well, I see it all the time. Feed the patient. We are so bad at not making sure our patients get fed. And uh, enteral nutrition, I'm a big fan of the small bore, weighted NG tubes. And again, if you get to rotate with me, we'll uh, talk about that. Get the lines out. So critical care isn't putting things in people. It's not needing them. And that's true of an endotracheal tube also. So this study, this, this uh, lecture, emphasizes that. If you can avoid intubating them or keeping the tube out after extubation, you do improve the prognosis if you do it appropriately. So you get the lines out when they should come out. What's the most common cause of nosocomial infection? Most common. Easy question. UTI. What's the second most common? Probably not. So get the Foley's out, get the endotracheal tubes out, get your lines out, central line. If you don't need them, get them out, because that's the next one. And then maybe skin infection. Um, identify complications. So we get so much in the habit, especially in the ICU. Oh, the patient came in with pneumonia. Let's just treat the pneumonia. They went into ARDS. Let's antibiotic. You've got to make sure you're not fluid overloading them, getting secondary infections we just mentioned. So you've got to be vigilant every day. What I do every morning is I go, what do I need to do today to make my patient well? Especially when they're really sick. When they're really sick and I'm sort of like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. How am I going to get this patient better? Instead, I just stop and say, what do I need to do today? If I can have a plan for today, tomorrow morning I'm going to regroup and ask myself the same question. So it's very helpful even uh, for myself, who's been doing this all day. 
um, address end of life issues as appropriate. And I, I think we've all done a terrible job of that for many, many years, and now we're swinging the other way and uh, doing a better job, and it's more emphasized. But I've always felt strongly that we need to address that early and talk to families. Now, that doesn't mean you go to the family and say, you want us to shock your relative and you die. It, and they say no. Or they say yes. You need to talk to them over time. A lot of people, when you initially talk to them, they say, I want everything. I want everything done. But as they see their relative going through the critical illness, they realize that maybe this... So you don't get frustrated. When I was young, I get frustrated with people that, you know, I knew the patient was going to do well, and the family's going, do everything, do everything. I don't get frustrated anymore. What I do is I go, I understand, we're going to be very aggressive, but you need to meet again in two days. And bring, bring your other family members. And I ask them, I go, do you see what's going on? And I, I make them be aware and participate in what we're doing to their family members. Do you see how many tubes we have in them? But most people, not everybody, but most people will work through it themselves. And by, if you talk to them on a regular basis, they will help you come to the conclusion that, yes, it's time to stop. And, and I try to tell people to make decisions at decision point. So they really struggle. And my mother did that. Well, a decision point might be starting dialysis. Or reintubating a patient after they fail an execution. Or even reintubating the scar. So I try to help people be very clear of the decision they're making in the giving time. Rather than just saying, you want us to keep going? And um, again, I would hope that some of y'all get to, to work with me. So in summary, Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is appropriate and beneficial in selected patients, hypercapnic respiratory failure, hydrostatic pulmonary edema, weaning from full ventilatory support. Some immunosuppressed patients, I'm not completely convinced that that should be a standard recommendation. Um, and again, I put that wrong, 48 to 72 hours. Um, BiPAP at 5 over 15 is a good starting place. So, you know, I just did this whole lecture and you're going, oh, what numbers do I pick? Well, let me tell you what. You could just do 5 and 15 over everything. And you might go up a little bit. People aren't going to tolerate more than 20 very well. Really, what you want to do is get the positive, pre the, the pressure support number higher. You don't, you're not really pushing the people. They need so much PEEP or CPAP to oxygenate, they probably need to be more. Let me, and I didn't make this point earlier, I meant to. When you have a ventilator, a mechanic, the patient's intubated, and you put them on pressure support with P. The pressure support they're getting is the difference. So if they're on 20 of pressure support, 5 of P, they're getting 15 of pressure support. It's not the same on a BiPAP machine or a BiLab machine. If you have them on 20 um, over 5, uh, they're only getting 15. So uh, let's go back to 1505. On a bi-level machine, if you have them on 1505, they're only getting 10 of pressure support. Whereas on a full ventilator, they're getting the full 15. Does that make sense? 10 of pressure support isn't very much. And I'm telling you that most of the studies show that the average is about 15 over 5. They're only getting 10 of pressure support. I excavate people from 10 of pressure support all the time. It's not a lot of support. So the mass ventilation is partial support. It's not full support. You have to understand, if the patient's particularly sick, you're not giving them a lot of as much help as they may need. And that's why they fail. That's why they do that. Um, do not use as a stepwise therapy. So use it when it's indicated, what the literature says, what I've tried to show you today. Everybody doesn't, doesn't, you know, clump right then and need to be intubated. Everybody doesn't get BiPAP and then intubation. You're going to increase morbidity and mortality. The people that should get BiPAP are the people that have diseases you've diagnosed, that you at least think they have, that we've shown, that the literature has shown benefits. And you can make some exceptions. You can say, you know, this an elderly person with maybe a viral pneumonia without secretion. I don't think she's going to get over this without us having a You can try. But you have to have a low threshold for saying it's working or not. Okay, so special circumstances, temporizing for airway management. So you younger doctors may be in this situation. You know what? I'm not comfortable intubating this patient. We need to wait for help. Let's just put them on BiPAP for like 
if it's a healthy event or not. Do not intubate patients. That's a difficult situation. I'm very clear to families when I use non-invasive ventilation in this setting. I say, 48 hours. So if you're not getting better within two days, we really need to be realistic that it's probably not going to work and we're just prolonging suffering. Most people accept that as long as you explain it up front. Coming and trying to explain it after two days is not as good. You've got to tell them up front. So we accept it. I will not let them say, well, can we try this first, and then we'll decide in two days. Because I just taught you that if they have the disease process that doesn't respond to non-invasive ventilation, all you're doing is decreasing their chances of the intubation working. So I tell them, you really need to decide today. Is your patient, is your relative a do not intubate or not? Because if we're going to try to save them, we need to intubate them today. It's not appropriate to say, let's try non-invasive ventilation for two days, and then maybe we'll intubate because you have shot yourself in the foot. You're not going to help your patient, and you're going to drag out a suffering even longer. You might still help them, but the data doesn't support that. Right. So chronic respiratory failure and sleep apnea patients with acute disease, um, we, we sort of mentioned that already. And finally, for maybe, you know, if you're doing a clinical trial. But it's interesting. The, the, the newer studies really haven't shown us more than what we already kind of learned early on, which I tried to emphasize. Finally, appropriate use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may be life-saving and decrease length of stay, and appropriate use may be fatal and increase length of stay. No when to hold up, no when to fold up.